Hello, everyone and everybody. I am happy to uh, you could come to this webinar series uh, we dedicated to, to this main uh, issue we are dealing with uh, since uh, the last year. That means uh, an outbreak that uh, has changed our everyday life and for many aspects of the life of the whole world. Um, we thought uh, of uh, organizing a series dedicated to issues related to global health, uh, ethics and technology uh, since the past year after discussing and confronting with some colleagues here in Trento with a colleague who joined us past year in Trento for his uh, for one year of research from Cameroon, Jerome B. And uh, we started thinking uh, which kind of impact can have these pandemics if we look uh, at the at its global dimension. So what does it mean uh, for healthcare in local context, but at the same time on a global scale? So in order to reflect on the main issue uh, involved by the pandemics, there are so many that could spend uh, a, a longer series or we could organize a longer series. But anyway, we selected some main issues and uh, we will start uh, today with uh, uh, this first uh, episode on global health and uh, we will move on uh, reasoning on uh, some spe more specific matters as the matter of justice and equity in allocating, uh, allocating scarce resources, uh, the matter of uh, um, understanding how the pandemics uh, uh, impacts uh, on fragile patients, on very fragile patients, uh, and what does it mean, the, the notion or the concept, the concept of vulnerability in this, uh, at this time. We will reason about the contribution of technologies uh, to face uh, with uh, COVID-19 patients uh, treated at home. Uh, instead in, in, in an institution, in an hospital. And we will consider which is uh, also the contribution of uh, uh, the global faith-based healthcare organizations in this uh, specific emergency, considering uh, researches we have uh, done uh, and driven in the past here at the Center for uh, Religious Studies, where, where we are. We will... Uh, uh, and uh, the, the series considering also what does it mean to consider past experiences of pandemics, uh, uh, in, in pandemics uh, who hap which happened in the past centuries, and which kind of contribution together with the historical studies can bring uh, to the present debate also the future studies, which are a new field of uh, research and uh, of uh, discussion. So, um, there are clearly related to this uh, global health uh, matter a lot of uh, um, elements that uh, drive us uh, to reconsider values and ideas we tend to adopt in our society as equity or solidarity, the matter of social justice, uh, and also the relevance of human rights. With uh, our speakers with the invited speaker we hope uh, to to have the possibility or to create a space where uh, to have a confrontation that can help us to to reason about uh, uh, some of these aspects uh, step by step so uh, i thank you for um, really much for coming i should ask you something uh, after the welcome if you if the participants can turn off uh, video and audio it will be of help for us because the session uh, the episode will be recorded and it, there is a better result if you can turn off uh, video and audios and uh, then you you can intervene directly rising hands or simply saying i wish to uh, ask a question or sending uh, um, sending the question through the the, the chat. So, 
Uh, now I thanks I thank again all of you for coming. I, I give the floor to Marco Ventura, who is the director of the Center uh, for Religious Studies at the Bruno Kessler Foundation in Trent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, and welcome uh, everybody from Fondazione Bruno Kessler for this fantastic. Uh, series of uh, uh, panels devoted to uh, such a sensitive and, 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 and momentous uh, topic. We're extremely pride, uh, proud of um, hosting the series and I wish to welcome and thank uh, the audience, first of all, those who are live with us uh, tonight and those who, who will uh, take uh, the event uh, um, online in the recorded uh, version, since uh, the event is, is, is in fact recorded. Um, I also wish uh, to thank the speakers, and well, the speakers who are with us tonight and uh, with, the, uh, with the honor and burden to start the series. It's not just the, 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 an episode of the series, this is the first one. And you have the responsibility, and I'm putting some pressure on all of you to start well in order to encourage uh, uh, our audience to uh, uh, follow in the next episodes. And we are uh, extremely, extremely grateful to all of you for having made the necessary arrangements, for having prepared your, your presentations and being uh, willing uh, to, to partake in this uh, uh, join effort. So many thanks to the speakers tonight and uh, uh, to the speakers who will follow and who have accepted to uh, to be uh, with us in the following episodes. Uh, very very special thanks to our uh, partner, very very dear and cherished partner, the University of Trento, and in particular the Department of uh, Humanities. And I'm so happy that. We managed to have uh, this event uh, together. FBK and Università di Trento have a long story of uh, 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 collaboration with all committees, and not only to continue, not only to continue, but uh, to make uh, this uh, strategic alliance stronger and stronger. Uh, so my uh, uh, warmest gratitude to University of Trento in general the Department of Humanities and my dear friend Michele Nicoletti in particular. Uh, next, uh, 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 thanks to the staff at FBK and the Center, uh, which have uh, made uh, the event possible, and which are, you know, they're, they're working uh, uh, behind the scenes, but their support and the, and, the, and the human and professional quality of their support uh, means so much to, to us, and I really wish to uh, express uh, our gratitude uh, to them and to Isabella Mazet in particular. And uh, last but not least, uh, I, I want to say something uh, about Lucia Galvani, who's been single-handedly almost uh, uh, conceiving uh, this uh, fantastic series uh, and we all know uh, her for her commitment, for you know, uh, her, her, her enduring, enduring uh, uh, a passion and, and, and another undertaking. This is very much a series to uh, image, in, in a sense. It's deep, it's broad, uh, there's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's sensitive, the selection of speakers, the selection of topic, uh, uh, everything, everything speaks to uh, her great commitment, and uh, uh, again, uh, that's the word: uh, a passion for for research and uh, uh, for a research that, as much as possible, makes uh, the world better. After this, uh, thank you uh, uh, again, everyone. Uh, welcome to everybody. And the floor is back to Lucia or to Michele. Thank you. I, I think, thank you so much. I, I give the floor um, to Michele Nicoletti for his welcome and thank you for coming and joining, joining us. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Marco, and good afternoon. Uh, to everybody, uh, just a couple of welcoming words also from my side and 
from uh, from the Department of uh, Humanities uh, uh, that has cooperated uh, in um, organizing uh, uh, this uh, series of uh, webinars. But uh, first of all, I would also like to thank uh, Lucia Galvani for her impressive work in uh, coordinating uh, this uh, series of webinars. Uh, she has been able to invite and to involve speakers uh, uh, and discussants coming from different continents. Uh, and this gives us really the idea of a global uh, discussion on a global issue. So thank you. Thank you very much to Lucia and thank you to Marco Ventura and to the Center for Religious Studies of the uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation. And uh, uh, I'm really happy that our cooperation uh, can continue. And I really hope that also in the future we can not only continue but strengthen uh, it uh, in this uh, common field uh, of, uh, of interest. Uh, well, uh, needless to say that a, a global pandemic uh, requires uh, a global approach, uh, which has to be multicultural on one side and on the other side multidisciplinary. And uh, I think that one of the most interesting and maybe original mm, contribution of these webinars is exactly the contribution that humanities can give uh, to the discussion of, uh, of the pandemic crisis and its uh, consequences. Uh, and I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, philosophers, uh, uh, ethicists, uh, political scientists, uh, lawyers uh, are here uh, together uh, engaging a, a discussion with uh, with medicine biology and uh, uh, and other other fields uh, of uh, research uh, and of course also of, of action um, but I think that the 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 pandemics uh, effect uh, uh, have been and are not only immense uh, on the concreteness of human life but also on the meaning of life or of death of disease of sociability uh, and this is why i think that humanities can give a, a contribution for this better understanding of what is going on because on one side uh, we need a, a strong action and we we all uh, welcome very much uh, the, the, the strong commitment uh, in, in, in vaccination that is going on all over the world. On the other side, we, we need uh, an understanding in, in depth uh, of what is the meaning of the pandemic on, on human life uh, and how can we uh, have not only effective but also uh, just uh, uh, policies and uh, respect of, 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 of the human life. Uh, I think that we, we have had uh, a strong commitment in the field uh, of vaccination and this is good and, uh, and uh, we, we all are fighting for uh, an equal access uh, to vaccination by discussing about global health. Uh, we, we cannot forget uh, that uh, we need also strong commitment uh, for the access to water, to food, mm, uh, to, to basic uh, health uh, and, and not only uh, to vaccines, uh, which uh, plays, of course, a, a crucial role in, in, the, in the fight against pandemics. So mm, meaning of life, meaning of death, uh, social justice, uh, these uh, are all issues uh, on which uh, philosophy, uh, law, ethics, uh, and politics uh, uh, can give a strong contribution and I really I'm grateful for, for uh, this uh, webinars and looking forward uh, to follow the discussion and to our speakers. Thank you, Lucia. You have the floor. Thank you, Michele. So now I, I will introduce Eduardo Missoni, who is our first speaker. Eduardo is a physician who worked at the intensively in the international development cooperation in the past 
Actually, he teaches in different universities, uh, both in Italy and in, uh, in other countries. He's teaching at the Bocconi University in Milan, at the School of Management, the Bicocca University, at the Faculty of Medicine in Pavia, and then uh, International at the Geneva School of Diplomacy and in the Mexican Institute uh, for Public Health. Uh, Eduardo has worked and written extensively on global health and uh, um, global health policies. Uh, his last work and uh, book is, uh, has been published in the, at the beginning of this year and it's dedicated to the present pandemics. The title, the book is in Italian. Uh, he published this book uh, with uh, Nicoletta Dentico, and the title is uh, in Italian Geopolitica della Salute, COVID-19, OMS e la Sfida Pandemica, un in English um, Geopolitics of Health, COVID-19, World Health Organization and the Pandemic Challenge. So I give the floor to Eduardo. I thank him again for joining us, uh, coming back from Mexico. So bringing also a global uh, approach and the uh, and, uh, atmosphere to, to our webinar. Thank you again and uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lucia. And uh, thank you to the Foundation and to the University of Trento for the invitation. It's a great honor to participate and with so other prestigious speakers. Um, to face, to start with, I think we need to define the, what, we, uh, what we speak of. And uh, I think that my task, my pre uh, first task actually, is to give a definition of global health. Because there is a lot of debate about what global health really is and there are different interpretations, and we have been discussing, I think, this term now in the last uh, 20 years, at least. Um, and indeed, uh, for many universities, many uh, scholars, sometimes it has been a, a just a, a rewarding, a cosmetic exercise of what would be called before uh, tropical medicine, international medicine, or international health, and in, instead, uh, global health is a real, completely new area of work. At least it was new, I mean, 20 years ago when we started working on, on these issues. And, um, but still today, very often, if you read in, in university programs uh, uh, telling us, uh, for example, uh, global medicine programs, global medicine internships, it, it is in, reali in reality just uh, another name for speaking of medicine in third world countries or internships uh, in developing countries and so on. Uh, instead, as I said, we have to take global health as a complete different area of work. Obviously, international cooperation uh, in health is part of global health, but it's very, a very limited component of it. What we really study when we speak of global health is the effects of globalization on health, which evident, evidently can only be an interdisciplinary study. Uh, in, indeed, we don't define global health as a discipline. Uh, we, we define it as an area of studies, an area of practices and research, which studies the effects of globalization on health. But obviously, uh, we cannot limit it to this. By the way, let me, as, a, as, a, as in brackets, I say we understand health in the, in, in the definition that W. Joe gives of it, which it means a comprehensive, complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, on which I will come back underlining, highlighting this social well-being, which is directly connected with health. But we cannot only stay on the, on the effects of globalization on health. We want to be actively promoting equity in health for all. In other words, we take a specific ethical stand when we study globalization and its impact on health, and we look for solutions which respond exactly to this idea of equity in health for all people, at all ages, everywhere. 
And then we, we try to understand not only the impact of globalization on health, but what are the determinants of this impact? The health determinants, the overall issues, and then go into the solutions. We, we could say determinants understood as the causes of the causes, the structural elements of how society is organized and how this impacts on health. And obviously, we look specifically on those global structural factors. The, the I would say, the hegemonic uh, uh, or dominant uh, thinking and policies that are sometimes imposed on people and have an impact on health. So the causes of the causes, the, the real structure of society. And then we see how it uh, also includes not only health of the people, but the health systems and the healthcare system how this uh, healthcare system uh, react or can react or suffer from the globalization down to the local health system, so down to what we would call uh, the, the, the functioning of the primary healthcare services or first level of care, and then how we can respond to this uh, from, from the local level up to the global level where the international authorities uh, are there with the mandate, I'm thinking specifically of the World Health Organization, with the mandate of being the coordinating and directing authority of uh, uh, World Health. Now, as we have to jump from a diff ah, no, let me just complete this concept. Later on, in recent years, somebody uh, tried to introduce the concept of planetary health. And uh, and I say this is a just, uh, uh, well, it was the Lancet, so I'm now saying something uh, not against, but it will not be uh, very happy, the people of the Lancet or the Rockefeller Foundation who promoted it. They said planetary health because the global health definition and area of work is considered limited. But they had that um, limited concept of global health, which is, you know, this cosmetic exercise. I say when we speak of global health, I say we because it's a work of a group and a wider network of people working on these issues. We say global having in mind the globe and the globe is the planet. So really global is, is also, if you want also in the wording means also integral. You know, we sometimes we say a global view means an integral view, a comprehensive view. So it is comprehensive, but especially it is global meaning the globe, the planet, Earth. And therefore, we don't feel the need to add planetary to put the focus or to highlight the focus uh, of an environmental approach, because this is what planetary health wanted to uh, introduce, a specific uh, uh, focus on the environmental issues which are linked with health. So global for us is including whatever it is meant with planetary health and the connection between humanity and the rest of the planet and the rest of the planet being animals, plants, and I would say including minerals, including the water, including, I mean, nature with a, with a big capital N. Another concept which is included in global health, in our concept of global health, is one health. It also becoming very popular, especially during the pandemic because one health links the health of other being uh, in so plants uh, especially animals because we are dealing now with a zoonosis uh, in other words a, a disease which is shared between animals and humanity but one health means we cannot find the right answers for human health unless we consider the rest of the nature uh, and I would say in that, I, I let, me, let me use the work of Pope Francis when he says an integral ecology. And this is exactly the approach that we have in mind when we work on global health. Having in mind the health of humanity, but having the health of humanity inside a planet which needs to be respected. We are just guests in this planet. And we are guests in this planet as a generation. So we have to leave something. We have a responsibility also for future generations. So global health is not only health today, but it's health, we technically would say sustainable health, uh, health which is there also and can be provided also to future generations. Now, coming from 
the global health definition, what we study, what we understand under global health. Let me now come to policies, because all this discourse, all this definition is a nonsense unless we are able to connect it to the transformation we want to, uh, to, to provide to the world, the change that we want to be in the world. Uh, so uh, we, this is a, is a message that I always pass to my students and say, it, it, we don't need to study notions or, or policies unless we have clear what is our objective, our mission. And our mission is equity and health for all. It's a, it's a better world. It's, it's really a change in the current system. Uh, so we come from there to governance, to policies. Academically, we define three levels of governance. We define global health governance understood as the interaction, uh, the processes, the balance of powers, which involve all those actors which work on what we generally define the health sector. So in relation with health authorities, having in mind specifically health care system more than health system. In Italian, we can make the difference with two words. We speak of salute and we speak of sanità, making a clear difference. In English, this is a little bit different because we always work, speak of health. For example, the World Health Organization, is it in Italian the Organizzazione Mondiale della Salute or della Sanità? And, and obviously this changes completely the perspective because if we say salute, we say health in the sense of the health of the people, caring for policies for health, uh, in support of health in all uh, dimensions, in all sectors, in all policies. If we say sanita, we mean public health. We, we define a health sector. We define the health authorities. We are defining a health care system, more or less uh, extended to a number of preventive actions. So global, gov um, yes, global health governance expresses this limit to the health sector with a uh, World Health Organization in the middle, a number of other international institutions, UN, World Bank, uh, global philanthropies, uh, um, the private sector, corporations, NGOs, civil society, but all those who deal with the health sector. Then we have to make a step, a step further thinking in policies. If we have health in mind as the health of the people, the comprehensive status of well of well-being which is physical mental and social then we have to involve many other public policies we have to look at the educational system we have to look at the food system we have to look at the problems related to migration to industrialization uh, to environmental policy to industrial policy to macroeconomic policies and therefore we have developed the concept of governance for health where the priority is health where it's not the GDP or the GNI, my priority when I think about economic policies. It's not economic growth, my end result. That I can measure that. But my goal is the health of the people, a wide concept of health, the well-being, people who enjoy their life, they can fully exploit all their opportunities and their competences, their passions, and they can really be involved, engaged, empowered in transforming the world. That is having health at the center of any public policy. Uh, when I think of the environment, I don't think of uh, biodefensive or biodiversity or, or, or controlling climate change and global warming just for the sake of the, of the planet, obviously. But I do it for the survival of humankind and I know that humankind cannot survive if not together. And now we say we, we are all safe only if we are all safe all together. Yes, but all together means all the other beings on earth that we have to respect. And that is a fundamental concept in, in approaching global governance for health. And finally, there is a third dimension, which is uh, governance for global health, which is what happens at the national level and how we can contribute from our local to national level or sovereign national thinking of the European Union for Europeans and our contribution to, to, the, to, the, to the global health altogether through our limited sometime actions at local level, the way 
we behave, the way we, we promote certain issues. So uh, when we speak of globalization and health, we are really bringing in, in this debate, all the dimension of human life and of relations between humanity and the rest of the life on the planet. We measure health. We are interested in having health as a priority, not having other elements as a priority, such as I was making the example of economics. I say this, underline this, and emphasize this, because even in, in, in looking for a path out of the pandemics, most of the leaders in the world are only concerned in relaunching the economy and measuring it through economic indicators. And this is not acceptable from a human point of view. Economy is a mean, but the goal is humanity, is the human being, the, is the planet, is life. In that sense, I really think we should be able to shift the paradigm to modify what we understand for progress, for development, uh, you know, for, for, for improvement, uh, emancipation, if you want, uh, of, uh, uh, of humanity. So uh, I, I, that's why I'm emphasizing this, because we are living through this. It seems that the concern is only relaunching industry, relaunching tourism, building more and putting everywhere. I'm not speaking of the Italian environment. I'm speaking, I'm looking globally. All governments are concerned about the economy as, as something in itself. Economy is a mean. If we don't have human being in the middle, then we are absolutely lost. And now come to the last aspect, which is will then, then connect to what other speakers will say, is how we can face COVID, how we come out of this pandemic. First of all, this pandemic has taken us to surprise. As a surprise, no. People in, uh, in concerned areas of work, public health people, but also many other researchers knew perfectly that this was coming. Since uh, at least since 2003, we are discussing about a potential pandemic. There was SARS-1, then we had H1N1, the so-called swine flu, then we had Ebola, and every time, then we had MERS, then we had Zika, every time we were thinking it could be, you know, the Big Bang, and it was not. It was self-contained, uh, with more or less mortality, fatality, etc., but was less contained. And when it came, once again, another pandemic, and it's not the first, and it's not the last. It was in China, and we say, okay, that's a, a Chinese story. We made jokes about Chinese. And then it came in Italy, and then it came in the United States, and then it went around the world, and the world was not prepared, was not prepared because they had never uh, retained the information that we already had, that globalization with the high interconnectedness, speed of travel, um, interconnectedness in the market, product goods going one side to the other without any control because the only message was making profit out of the market, it was producing all this. And for profit, we have destroyed forests. We have entered environments which were once one time se uh, separated from the humans. Forests, uh, areas of other areas of of, uh, uh, of nature, oceans, if you want. We have commercialized to to a, 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 to a logarithmic level uh, animals for the only purpose of selling these animals and increasing the consumption and then looking for new strange animals, exotic, beyond the local cultures, because there may be a local culture for eating wild animals. Actually, this is our origin. It's, 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 it's the origins at the at root of humanity. But one thing is having a, a, a eating animals because it's a source of proteins, which is needed to our body, and another issue is making it a commerce and, uh, and con pro promoting it, the, a, a expanded, exported uh, beyond any borders. We are um, breaking the barrier which was getting us with keeping our security in terms of health. And then we speak of the spillover of a virus. Virus were always there. Virus are doing their job 
in ensuring the progress of the evolution of the species, you know, by exchanging and correcting uh, uh, genoma. They are a vehicle of the biodiversity. They are a vehicle of evolution. And uh, uh, they, they are not necessarily uh, pathogenic. We know this. But if we break the barriers, we, we uh, facilitate what we have called the spillover. Now everybody knows these terms because they are commonly in the news. Uh, so there is where we increase the risk. It is, was the case for Ebola, it was the case for MERS, and now it's a, ca it's a case for, uh, for uh, COVID. Now, let me say, the next pandemic may not be another coronavirus, may be something else. Maybe the, the, the a, a, a expansion of tuberculosis or syphilis, all diseases that we already thought uh, having overcome. And instead now, always because of the market rules, it's not the bat, it will be the chicken. Because it's full of hormones, it's full of antibiotics, it's producing antibiotic resistance. It's an enormous challenge for humanity. So we may face new pandemics from diseases we already know. We don't need a spillover. Because we are not respecting the rules of a natural food system. And instead we are producing and in, in only for the sake of consumption and of selling products. We have completely lost our humanity. So my answer, and sorry, I'm going really passionate about these things, but the, the issue is that if we want to manage COVID on the long term, we cannot manage COVID without considering the other challenges that we have. We, have, we need a systemic view and this systemic view means we really need to respect the environment. We really need to take action in controlling seriously the climate change, seriously the way we produce, seriously the way we pollute. We have to control all this because if we don't, and governments have the responsibility. I mean, the market, we know how it works. We know the interests that move the market. But we need governments that seriously regulate the market in order to ensure human life. So on the long term, we have to correct really is a paradigmatic shift in the, in, in, in the world. We need to focus as a priority on the environment. We have to regulate the market. We cannot be consumers. We want to be citizens. And young boys and girls in the streets tells us, remember the Fridays for Future, they know what they want. They may have not all the knowledge that we have uh, accumulated, but they know what they want. They want to have a different life for the future, and they want, especially they want life for the future, and we are not granting this to them. So we have to take it seriously, and in the light of social justice, as it has been mentioned just before. We cannot do this if we don't keep everybody on board. Remember that the agenda, Sustainable Development Agenda 2030, uh, concludes N nobody left behind. So nobody means nobody. It doesn't matter if you are the rich guy in, in the Northern Europe or in Italy or the, the, or, or the poor girl in the middle of Central Africa. Everybody is a value. Everybody is a human life. And we need to have this vision in mind when we discuss. And social justice means put the priorities where they have to be. Where there is more need, there is the priority. And we have seen, I'm sure that uh, Renzo Pegoraro will, will speak about the vaccine and how the vaccine has been distributed. Yeah, yeah I, I'm concluding. I see your hand. I am concluding. <laughs> uh, I know he will discuss, I'm, he must discuss about the equity in the distribution of, of vaccine and how this has been managed. So I will not insist on this. But let me just conclude in saying that we also have the need to rethink our health policies, not only, as I said, in terms of bringing health as a priority in all policies, but also rethinking our healthcare systems. We had a big lesson here in, uh, in Italy and in other countries, where you have a fun functioning health system which is able to deal with a disease at the primary level, at the community level, we have taught our, I am one of those products as a medical doctor. We have been taught that the medicine for the hospital, the, the, the medicine for intensive care, the medicine for the specialization. And therefore we don't have doctor in, in, in rural communities. Look in Mexico, that is a disaster. 
You don't have the doctors who, I mean, you have them, but not enough. Those who want to be with the community in the rural areas, including that are able to speak the language of the people of the many different ethnic groups in the communities. They all, all want to go into the private system. They all want to go to Houston, to, 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 to Italy, to Milano, to Germany, wherever, to work. And then we have the brain drain. That is also the change we have to bring in this world. We need doctors which are in the community and we need to strengthen our capacity to deal with this and the coming viruses, bacteria or whatever emergency at the primary level, means at the community level. We need to empower the community. I put a question, why did we invest only in vaccines and we did not invest or at least not enough, in drugs and other uh, things that can be used at the primary level. Maybe there are some interests that don't want us to, to discover that just generic drugs, very cheap drugs, may be very effective. Uh, and, and, and then we say there is no evidence, therefore you cannot use it. But we have enough evidence that this evidence is not recognized for some generic drugs which cost nothing. And the last, very last message is, it's not only about drugs, it's not about only about the health system, it's about a healthy system. We need to insist, and I don't hear this in the news, I see only statistics about the vaccine. We need to insist that people has to abandon harmful behavior. We need people need to eat healthy. They have to abandon any uh, food which is based on chemicals and has forgotten nature. We have to insist on the importance of physical exercise and our society should be organized about this freedom, uh, should be organized around social relation. There, there should not be a social distance. There should be a physical distance, but not a social distance. We have to recover this element of being community and doing things according to the law of nature, which are all laws, and sometimes we have betrayed them. I think I can conclude here. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for your wonderful introduction to a field that we, we all started to know, but uh, without understanding it so, so deeply and so broadly. So now I, I leave the floor to Renzo Pegoraro, just a, a short uh, introduction. Uh, Renzo is a physician too, he is also a theologian and a bioethicist. Uh, he was appointed for many years uh, at the Lanza Foundation in Padova, that is a foundation uh, which has dedicated a strong effort to improve bioethics uh, and bio the bioethical debate in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. Uh, Renzo served as president of the European Society of Philosophy of Medicine and Healthcare and uh, of the EACWA Association, that is the European Association of Centers of Medical Ethics. He teaches bioethics at the Divinity School of Triveneto and nursing ethics at the Pediatric Hospital Bambin Gesù in Rome. Since, the, uh, since September 2011, he is the counselor of the Pontifical Academy for Life in Rome. And uh, Renzo has uh, extensively written on topics uh, um, very uh, largely debated in bioethics. Thank you, Lorenzo, for joining us, and I give you the floor. So, uh, uh, thank you to Lucia and Professor Ventura and Professor uh, Nicoletti for this opportunity, and of course, Professor Missoni for this uh, very uh, well uh, uh, presented uh, opening of these uh, uh, topics, uh, so how to manage uh, to understand global health and uh, global uh, policies. And I try to, uh, to present in which way uh, the Pontifical Academy for Life uh, was uh, involved in the uh, pandemic with uh, some uh, documents uh, to uh, really at the beginning, more or less, of the pandemic, um, global pandemic and universal brotherhood note on the COVID-19 emergency of uh, the end of March uh, uh, 
2020 and uh, humana communitas in the age of a pandemic untimely meditation on life's rebirth july of last year both were more in the this perspective of a global situation global pandemic and uh, uh, to offer a, a, a global uh, approach stressing the uh, universal uh, uh, community um, the topics of the first uh, document uh, are solidarity in vulnerability and in limitations science medicine and politics so the social link put to test and uh, still now we are discussing about which kind of relationship between uh, science medicine and politics and uh, attention and protection to whom uh, are more weak old and fragile how to take into um, more attention and consideration this kind of population and for humana uh, communitas communitas we recognize the challenge of uh, interdependence and the lesson of this common vulnerability and the common uh, good of public health and global health so there is a, a call for global efforts and international cooperation to manage uh, this pandemic and a call for a conversion at all levels personal and social economical uh, and cultural environmental conversion to understand and to manage these crises and these uh, challenges the third uh, document uh, uh, introduced uh, three documents on specific uh, area of particular groups a special group of a population old age our future the elderly after the pandemic of last february and now is uh, uh, we have in preparation covid 19 and disabled people and covid 19 and children so inside a global view a global perspective how to analyze to understand and to support strategies for specific communities uh, particular vulnerable and suffering for the uh, pandemic uh, the next um, we organize also a, a online seminar life fraternity a common home so living the common home human impact on the natural basis of life and we remember uh, the Missoni presentation about our responsibility for uh, the environment and uh, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti healthcare perspectives in Pope Francis teaching how to combine uh, the respect of uh, environment and the idea of uh, to be member of uh, the human uh, community and uh, this experience of uh, brotherhood And one specific uh, um, focus was uh, dedicated to the anti-COVID uh, vaccines. So uh, uh, there is a, a document published in December, the end of December uh, of uh, last year, by the Vatican COVID-19 Commission. It was established uh, one year uh, ago to coordinate all initiatives, documents or actions in the area of uh, uh, this pandemic so this commission with the pontifical academy for life and the name and the title of a document is vaccine for all 20 points for a fairer and a healthier world how to manage this problem this uh, resource uh, so the pandemic and the vaccines and to enter more in this perspective of justice and a healthier uh, world combining all uh, 
challenges and all perspectives that are present in the world, in this global uh, approach. And uh, in this uh, document, and I analyze better the, the, the different uh, paragraph, we have a fundamental principles and values, the issue of research and production of vaccines, approval, distribution, and administration of uh, the vaccines, and uh, some practical guidelines. Uh, the ethical scientific evaluation, global cure with local flavor, partnership and participation, joining forces, leadership, and the church at the service of healing the world. But the most uh, uh, relevant uh, um, issue, and I focus my uh, presentation on, on them, is uh, um, are the fundamental principles and values. And what are the more important uh, aspects in, uh, uh, in this area? Um, so fundamental uh, principles and values. So in the document, uh, we stress more some ethical issues and some moral responsibilities at the personal, but also uh, at the religious community, in particular the Catholic Church, and the institutions, organizations, NGOs involved in this uh, uh, pandemic uh, and how to manage the challenge coming from the pandemic. So, uh, uh, the first is availability and accessibility uh, to all. So, the strong uh, uh, statement uh, uh, to reinforce the need of uh, availability uh, uh, to the uh, vaccines to everybody, for everybody. And here there is a recall of the principles of church, uh, uh, church uh, social teaching, human dignity, solidarity and subsidiarity, common good and the care uh, for the common home, justice and universal destination of goods. So how or in which way to recall, reaffirm these uh, principles that can uh, be the, uh, the inspiration and guides uh, to uh, manage the uh, challenges coming from the uh, pandemic. Um, second is uh, uh, the life uh, cycle of uh, uh, vaccines. So it is important to define the all steps concerning the vaccine and uh, recognize the ethical questions, problems, but also the actions that uh, we can uh, prepare and off, uh, offer for each step of this uh, cycle. So the production, distribution, uh, priorities, patents, and also hesitancy uh, to be vaccinated. So, uh, because uh, sometimes there is uh, uh, there was some discussion about uh, vaccines, but we don't uh, define the different problems, and uh, we don't propose more specific answers and uh, solutions. Um, in fact, uh, if uh, we uh, discuss about the production. Uh, there was a discussion, it is still present in some countries, especially in the US, uh, the issue uh, concerning the production of uh, these uh, vaccines. Uh, and uh, the, the, about the production, there is one, that is one of the reasons raised by some Protestants and Catholics to refuse these uh, vaccines. Um, I, uh, the biological materials used uh, for the development of the vaccines. So the use of uh, immortalized cell lines 
from voluntary aborted fetuses. So uh, it is not acceptable to use uh, these vaccines because for the production there is a, a sort of uh, uh, cooperation with uh, voluntary uh, abortion. Th this problem was uh, uh, clarified uh, very, uh, in a very uh, good uh, permanent way by the Catholic Church and also in the document uh, we recommended all clinical recommended vaccina vaccinations can be used with a clear conscience and the use of such vaccines does not signify some sort of a cooperation with the voluntary abortion. So there are no moral problems to use the vaccines by Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson. Because the use of these uh, uh, cell lines is a, a kind of only materia, a very far passive uh, cooperation without a link with uh, uh, voluntary abortion that was uh, made 40, uh, 45 years ago uh, for other reasons and not uh, connected with uh, uh, scientific research or this kind of projects for, for vaccines. But that is one of the hesitance present and it is important to offer more information and clear arguments uh, to uh, help the people to accept the things and not to have a kind of prejudiced uh, approach uh, to, to them. Uh, Sometimes there is a hesitancy uh, because uh, uh, the vaccines were produced very fast, so only uh, in a few months and uh, we are, there are no uh, guarantees, no uh, clear uh, documents about the safety of the vaccines. Uh, but on the, in the document also we clarified the specific role of the regulatory uh, authorities and it is important uh, the documents the, uh, to respect the steps of uh, uh, experimentations and when we have an approved uh, vaccines we need to recognize the uh, specific role of these authorities and uh, to be sure that everything was uh, corrected of course, we are in an urgent emergency uh, situation. So it was a, a really a fast uh, process to have a vaccine in a short time. But on the other side, we try to uh, have a good transparency and information about that. But it is important to offer good information and clear, correct information to the, to the people, to the population. Because sometimes there was a, a confusion of information, there was an overlapping of uh, scientific, uh, medical, uh, social uh, information. And sometimes there was uh, uh, also a confusion between uh, the, the authorities uh, you know the, the, the example of uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, to permit, uh, to approve, to stop, uh, to approve again different uh, uh, ages uh, over 60, under 60, <laughs> over 60s. And so how to uh, guarantee uh, a clear communication and information to avoid uh, this kind of uh, resistance or hesitancy uh, to, uh, to vaccine. And so we completed uh, the, 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 the discussion about uh, the mechanism of production and how to uh, inform about the action of uh, uh, vaccines because uh, some differences 
are uh, important to define the priorities uh, in the population, which kind of people uh, is better to vaccinate first and how to manage also in different areas of the country, how to manage uh, in some context where there is difficult, for example, for example, to have two doses and to have a vaccine for, with only one dose is more practical and more useful in some context. Uh, vaccine patents uh, is a, a big issue uh, how uh, the vaccine can become a common good, as it was said by the president of the uh, European Commission. Um, and how to avoid the logic of only the market or a kind of vaccine nationalism. So the vaccines are really uh, a common good and uh, there is the proposal um, of managing the patents uh, so uh, to facilitate universal access and to uh, suspend, to interrupt patents for a time, for one year. So to uh, create a condition that uh, is possible to produce uh, vaccines in many countries, in many places, to apply the principle of subs subsidiarity. So to help each country or a group of countries to produce by themselves the vaccines and to cover the needs of uh, the population. So uh, the sole purpose of a commercial exploitation is not acceptable in the field of medicine and healthcare, particularly in the case of a, a pandemic. So it is important to recognize for the pharmaceutical companies the income coming from the, the cost of research and production. We need to recognize that there was a support by the states, public uh, funding of uh, uh, these uh, uh, researches and uh, production. And on the other side, we need to recognize the urgent need uh, to have uh, vaccines for the, uh, for the people. So how to manage this combination of uh, to cover the cost and uh, to have a, a feedback, also economical feedback for the com pharmaceutical companies, but on the other side, to guarantee uh, the vaccines uh, in all parts of the world. And so in the document, there is uh, the stress of a collaborative undertaking to encourage a collaboration among states, public institutions, pharmaceutical companies, and organization, other organizations, so that the production can be carried out simultaneously in different parts of the world. And we must recognize that there are some resistance, uh, difficult coming from some pharmaceutical companies to agree to participate. And uh, for many reasons, because there is a know-how and a particular information and knowledge that they don't want to share with other uh, people, you need the particular specific technologies, very sophisticated technology that is difficult to share in some countries. And of course, there are some uh, problems with the management of the vaccines, for example, the temperature to be very uh, maintained to storage, uh, it's very, very uh, cold uh, temperature that is very difficult to manage uh, in, many, in many countries. So we support this uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, approach, but uh, it, 
we recognize there are some difficulties uh, to manage this. And an important um, topic is about administration and assess. So at the international level, it implies to avoid that some countries receive the vaccines late because of the prior large scale purchase by richer states. The states that are buying a lot of vaccines and other uh, countries that uh, are very, uh, are, uh, they have a lot of difficulties to have the vaccines. Don Renzo, sorry. Can I because ask I you? Gra thank you. So uh, I conclude with uh, uh, the importance of the World Health Organization, but also we have to recognize the, a crisis of this organization. And so the problem of the pandemic for the future, how or in which way to have an organization that is able to manage a global approach. And the stress of moral responsibility at the personal level, and so avoid the refusal of vaccines, because such a refusal could seriously increase the risk for public health. So the risk for my health and the health of other people that uh, they cannot be vaccinated. And uh, more responsibilities at the uh, level of states, government and other institutions to create this uh, more global cooperation to offer this uh, uh, good uh, uh, these vaccines to, to resolve the, to prevent the disease or also to offer drugs for the people that they need uh, as a uh, now in India about oxygen or other drugs that uh, we need. Thank you for this, uh, uh, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Renzo, for your, uh, for your very complete presentation about uh, the work you have done as, uh, with the Academy. And now I give the floor to Angela Witwed, who joins us from from the US, from the United States, Washington DC, where she works as an independent consultant and uh, with a focus on bioethics, science policy and science communication. Uh, Angela has worked and has collaborated with the Department of Health and Human Services for what regards uh, more specifically the human research and human research protections and she has worked also at the National Institute of Health. So um, I leave the floor to Angela, who will help us to see how much uh, the health policies, uh, uh, the role of the health policies uh, in, during the pandemics in, in the context where, uh, where she leaves the States. Thank you, Angela, for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Professors Nisoni and Pegararo, for your comments. This has been a really enlightening uh, discussion so far. So I think um, my role here is to just give some brief comments, um, sort of tying together the, the comments the previous speakers have made and also bringing in a bit of the US experience in terms of our policy and public health um, experience over the past year with the pandemic. So I think uh, like a lot of other countries, there are some things that uh, the US did well. And I think there are some things that uh, we did not do so well. And I think there are a lot of lessons uh, to be learned moving forward because uh, as the previous speaker said, uh, this is um, certainly not the last time that we, you know, as a country and as, as a, a planet are going to uh, experience uh, something like this. Um, in hindsight, it, it seems that the US uh, really excelled at addressing problems that, that we can address with resources, right? So there are some problems that you can throw money at and fix it, and there are some problems that it, no matter the amount of resources you have, uh, you, can't, you can't address them. And, and we seem to have really taken the route of, of using our resources and our wealth um, internally uh, to, to address some of these issues. And I think the reasons for that I'll, I can come back to in a moment. Um, but uh, the things that, that we did 
that seem to have worked in some sense were economic stimulus programs. So the US had um, pretty significant economic stimulus internally. Um, we had three major programs that rolled out you know, last spring and then in December and then in this spring and, and all said um, gave out about $4.8 trillion uh, inside uh, the US. And most of this was in the form of unemployment benefits and direct payments to people um, to really try and, and counteract the, the economic effects that, that were being caused by some of the other restrictions and policies in place. And, and that was somewhat effective, um, you know, at least in comparison to some of our uh, peer countries, uh, other high income countries. And then I think really the most significant issue that, that resources could come into play was vaccine development and distribution. So Operation Warp Speed was a program started under the previous administration, gave $16 billion to, to kickstart uh, the development of, of several different vaccine candidates. And I, I think everyone would agree that the speed with which uh, the vaccines were, were developed, uh, tested, and rolled out was really a remarkable scientific feat. I, I don't know if even the most optimistic folks in this area would have thought that that we could accomplish what was accomplished uh, in the time that we have. So that was a significant accomplishment. And I think we're going to continue seeing the dividends of that you know, over the next year. And you know, as Professor Pegararo said, there are huge issues around global access and distribution. And, and that really is, vaccination is the end game, I think for all of us, um, you know, we, it's the beginning of the end now. And this won't be done until you know, we can have mass worldwide uh, vaccination. Some things that we, the US did not do so well were issues related to um, reducing transmission and prevention. Um, and these are really um, relying on, on sort of traditional public health measures like masking mandates, closing businesses and schools, things like that. Um, of course, these all have a cost. There are significant social costs, there are economic costs, there are issues of loneliness and isolation, um, costs to, to children, you know, who are not receiving the same education they otherwise would have had. But there was really a strong sense um, among the epidemiologists and public health professionals that those costs could be worth it in terms of the lives saved um, and, and um, preventing uh, the, the transmission of the disease. Um, and on that front, I think we really failed uh, to a large extent. Um, part of this is because of the sort of decentralized nature of authority in the United States. So there are only some things the federal government can do. Um, and they're, uh, in terms of those kinds of social restrictions, they're very limited. And I think this comes back to why maybe uh, the economic issues we did so well, because the one thing the federal government here can do is, uh, come up with money. So the federal government can deficit spend and it could go ahead and put out these big economic programs and most states and localities can't do those kinds of things. However, they do have significant control over school closures, business closures, all those sorts of things. And that was really, that had to be controlled at, at a state and local level. There was not much that could be done from above if there had been will. I think there's also an issue of the fact that um, at least for a large part of, of the pandemic, there wasn't political will at the federal level to develop any kind of consistent strategy either. But had they wanted to, um, it would have also been kind of challenging. And so these kinds of, of responses that required political will, really effective leadership, um, people buying into what the project was and cooperating on what it was that was going to be accomplished, uh, was really where we fell down. And I think, you know, I, I don't know if this was the issue in other countries, but there really became a, a strong political polarization um, to the extent that there was a lot of antipathy around restrictions and, and things. We had local governments passing laws in their localities that you could not have a mask mandate. So a store could not tell customers that they had to wear a mask to come into the store. So, um, it wasn't just a lack of buy-in, but it was really a, a strong um, political current that kind of picked up and gained traction throughout the course of last year that made this really difficult. And as a result of that, over a half a million people died in, 
in the US and a lot of those deaths were preventable. Um, you know, I think obviously, you know, this was a difficult pandemic and, and there are always mistakes made, but I think looking back, I think the biggest tragedy is that had we had uh, better actions around these, these voluntary measures to, to reduce transmission, to try and, and, and minimize the number of people who get sick, um, we could have saved a lot of lives. And of course there are justice and equity issues here because this pandemic disproportionately affected racial and ethnic minorities in the United States. And it exacerbated a lot of pre-existing inequalities that occur in our system, especially around healthcare. I think it really um, shone a light on how uh, the inequalities in the American healthcare system, which I think everyone <laughs> listening is, is very well versed in, in the many weaknesses uh, that we have in that respect. Um, so I just, yeah, I wanted to, to sort of make a distinction, I think, between there were, were some things that I think that, you know, we did well at, um, and I think they will continue to benefit us moving forward. I think the American economy is probably going to recover pretty well because of the economic stimulus. I think the vaccinations are, are going to continue uh, to, to be a huge boon, um, but it doesn't change the fact that a lot of people died who, who did not need to had the correct actions been put into place. And so I think coming back to the global perspective though, um, because we do have this, um, we have access to the re these resources that can be used effectively, that really puts an obligation on, on us to, to participate in this more global effort to drive vaccination. So, I mean, that's really the most pressing issue. As I said, it's, it's sort of the end game. We all know that. And so the US has a, a big role that it can play in, in in getting vaccine out to the rest of the world. Um, right now we have on order double the amount of vaccine we need to, to vaccinate our population, right? So we can start by uh, distributing the, the vaccines that we have on order, redirecting vaccines to other countries, providing funds to other countries for the manufacture and distribution of them, um, significantly upping our contributions to the COVAX program. And, and then the issue of patents as Professor Pegararo raised it's also really complicated right there just isn't in a lot of places the capacity and so just um, standing up the manufacturing capacity is huge it's it's not just about patents but there are important patent issues um, but i think you know all of this has uh is is an obligation that we have not only for justice and equity reasons although they are extremely important and and cannot be overlooked but also just you know this term of of one health as as professor missoni talked about you know we're all in this together and i think that uh, you know a lot of us keep our fingers crossed that tomorrow we don't wake up and there's a variant that our vaccines are no longer effective for and that is an issue that we all have to tackle uh, together and the us um, has the capacity to play a really large role in this. And I think we also have the obligation to do so. And so I think I will wrap it up with that and then um, move on to Lucia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Angela, for this uh, quick but very effective uh, uh, sketch of, uh, of a specific uh, and, and your peculiar context. So I, I wanted to add just one question because I think uh, we have a few minutes left. So I will just reduce to my question to uh, some observation about the first one regards uh, the relevance of the local context uh, and of the local culture also in dealing and facing these uh, an outbreak. That means clearly we need the global policies, but that one does it mean to um, implement them in uh, in, the, in a peculiar cultural, uh, sometimes also a peculiar religious context. And then the second question regards uh, a perspective, I like to say it's a tentative to look forward because I am wondering about the possible alternative models of public health to adopt. Clearly we adopted this model in the middle of an emergency and maybe there were no other ways to, to deal with, uh, uh, with uh, such a sudden and uh, um, impacting uh, uh, phenomenon. But I am, since past spring, I am continuously 
wondering about this element. Could we think uh, for the future that means uh, uh, like a take a home message, could we think of different public health models and maybe global health models? Because clearly when we talk of public health, we tend to adopt uh, the perspective of a specific country or a specific uh, um, uh, in, in community. But I think uh, the outbreak is uh, teaching us that we need to to adopt uh, and to like to say to find a balance between the local and the global to deal with uh, uh, sudden and uh, unpredictable or very heavy events. So I stop here my <laughs> it's just the question the philosophical questions <laughs> that tend to come from philosophers and i i leave the floor to the other participants if they have questions to ask please there is a silence i understand it's Don't be shy, <laughs> as the teachers say at school. So please don't be shy. If you like to ask, uh, I imagine there are also a lot of... Uh, Lucia, maybe we can take this time yeah. to, to react. And uh, if somebody comes, I stop immediately. Uh, I, I would like to argue against the fact that the vaccination is our end game uh, because uh, this is uh, what everybody would like us to think that just a technological situation will make us safe mm -hmm. and this will also bring all our attention, our focus on the security issue rather than on the health issue. And uh, we may discuss long if the vaccination is effective, not effective, mutants, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I will not go into this scientific debate. But what is very important is to pass the message that please be aware, vaccinated people, uh, vaccination is not the end game, because vaccinated people still may transmit the disease. First of all, so we still need to use distance, we still need to wash our hands, to be very careful with, dis with distance and mask, etc., etc. So this is the first message, it's a very important public health message, because if we think that the vaccine solved the problem, it's not. And the long term, we cannot expect to produce a vaccine for every new virus coming or every no new mutant coming, because uh, we don't have, we have money for all the rest of the health system and the uh, issues that we have to take care, especially if we want a universal healthcare system. And vaccines do cost, it's not for free. We will pay, future generation will pay the price that we are paying now into vaccines. So vaccines cannot be the end game. They are a useful tool, but not the end game. The end game is changing the paradigm, is changing, increasing our natural immunity. Food, what do we eat? What do we breathe? What do we drink? There is what is exposing us. Who is dying from from COVID-19. It's not the young 18 athlete or the normally not even the 80 years old vegetarian physical fit person. Those who die, majority, the average death rate is around 80. It changes from country to country. When you go down to Mexico, for example, those who die are younger, but they are all obese, diabetic, they have other comorbidities. So people, people live, population risk is another one. If we control the risk, if we modify the way we live, then we can prevent not only this outbreak, many others. Now, vaccination, because we are taken by surprise. But we have to consider, we cannot pass the message, I'm sorry, uh, Angela, I, I, we, we cannot pass the message, it's the end game. It's just a useful tool. Or it's a, it's a passage stage, we can say. Yeah. So uh, I think just just for clarification, I, uh, my reference was into this pandemic, right? I think I do think for this pandemic, for SARS-CoV-2, 
that that's how we get out of it. Uh, but I completely agree in terms of you know future concerns um, and and future pandemics and and there are major uh, environmental lifestyle changes that uh, will you know help pr uh, prevent future pandemics. But I I do think for this pandemic I I I think vaccination is is what's going to draw it to a close. Uh, Lucia. <laughs> Oh, yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, now we have this uh, challenge to combine a short term and a long term, term strategy. For a short uh, period, we need uh, something like uh, vaccines. And of course, uh, we need it to clarify that it is that it's not a magic <laughs> uh, therapy uh, to resolve uh, all problems and uh, to guarantee life uh, and, and, and for everybody easy and so so to avoid this view of uh, vaccines but we now we have some urgent emergency situation and the issue the the challenge is how to prepare a long-term action about healthcare system about uh, the change of uh, lifestyles the change of uh, our society and so and it could be very important to have a new kind of cooperation agreement among scientists politicians ngos religions how to manage these perspectives for the future because in this moment there is a the the, the pressure to return uh, to the to the back <laughs> uh, and not to prepare the future uh, we need to change uh, not uh, to come back to the time before the pandemic but to go uh, for the future to have a, a new paradigm a new strategies a new perspective uh, so. but i think it is not so easy uh, is there really I think it is important to have a moment like this uh, other event and so to create uh, a more clear understanding because it's not clear but in which way we are able to think I'm sorry to dream the future but the people they don't dream the future uh, they try to see they have a kind of nostalgia how, how do they say uh, the, the the idea of the past uh, not the dream uh, uh, of the future and so uh, i think we needed to stress this uh, cultural mental and uh, also spiritual approach that is able to uh, guide uh, disciplines and efforts Okay, thank you, Dorrance. We have a question from Francesca Marin, who is asking to Eduardo, in order to promote the systemic view proposed, you have proposed, do you think uh, training programs for future physician and healthcare professionals should change? In, if yes, in which way? Okay, <laughs> you know, we are already in the 1970s when I was at that time a young student at the Faculty of Medicine, there was a debate about how the faculty should be organized. And a gentleman, a public health man known as Giulio Maccacaro in Italy, was proposing una facoltà di medicina alla rovescia. In other words, a, a faculty of medicine the other way around. Which, because he was uh, expressing the need of having medical professionals which are linked to the community. And at that time, there was no single faculty or specialization who would grant the connection within the doctor and the community. Unfortunately, what is now 40, 50 years later, we have to realize that it's still, we are still in the same situation. The fact that there is, a, we have, in the name of scientific medicine, uh, a term which was introduced with the Flexner report at the beginning of the uh, and 20th century and for uh, strongly promoted by the Rockefeller Foundation we have standardized the teaching of medicine all over the world 
Few countries admit, for example, a different approach to medicine. Say in India, you can speak of Ayurveda and is authorized, is public, is taught in the universities. In China, you have traditional medicine, which is still taught. And other countries have different experiences. And that we normally, from the scientific medicine point of view, say, oh, that's bullshit. Huh? But we cannot do this because there are different systems of thinking that we have to consider. And you are philosophers, you are ethicists, so you understand what I'm as, as speaking of in this sense. But on top, even in scientific medicine, as it is called, we do not prepare our medical doctor to stay with the community. They have no idea of what the social determinant of health is. I am a privileged teacher in the Faculty of Medicine because in Pavia, in the Harvey International uh, course of medical school, we teach from the first year, and that's my course, the social roots of health. It is unique. And I'm debating this with colleagues with the United Kingdom, and normally sociologists are more interested in this, but not the medical profession. And if we train our medical people of becoming only ultra-specialized, uh, only focus on, on people in a horizontal position. I have been trained on people in a horizontal position, in bed in a hospital. No, I was not trained to see where the, when the disease originates in the school, in the factory, in the family, in the community, on the playground. That's what we should learn. This would focus... On, so my, my answer quickly is focus on the community. And therefore learn first what health is all about and then eventually look into the disease and try to be on the prevention rather than on the cure try to be in the community rather than the, in the hospital and this means starting the first year of medicine in a complete different way and on top of this you should have a training which is related to your reality being a medical doctor in the highlands of bolivia is not the same thing uh, of being a doctor in houston or in Rome, or in Milan, or where you like. And our communities are different. And even if you are in the highlands of Bolivia, you should not be trained on the model, you know, that you are trained in Houston, that then you cannot practice because you don't have the technologies. And then your only expectations are going to Houston to use those technologies. If we, and I was saying also, you don't even know the languages of the people you should, you should deal with. How many doctors uh, in Africa speak Swahili or, low, or even worse, local languages? Because Swahili is a, is, is a vehicular language. Hmm? And the same I could say in Latin America, it's just the same. Few doctors in Peru or Bolivia speak Quechua or Aymara or other, other languages. But an enormous component of their population uh, speaks those languages and do not manage adequately Spanish, which is a vehicular language. So including understanding the culture. I cannot deal with a Mapuche if I don't understand about cold and warm, about the orientation, the cosmovision of the population. I can only impose them a, a Western model. Instead, I must be able to know the Western model, to know all the technology, the, 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 the science that we have learned, but also being able to understand the different cultures and being able to create the encounter. And we don't train in this direction. So, yes, uh, I would do this. I would change it head down <laughs> totally the way we teach and the way we do it. And especially uh, teaching to listen. The teacher must be a learner and the learner must be a teacher. And this is reciprocal. Uh, this, this morning I was speaking with my students about my eutics, about participation, about a, 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 a joint learning process. So these are the elements that we have to introduce. This is valid for every single faculty. It's not only for medicine. But for medicine, it's very important because you relate with people directly and you must need to be able to, to listen to these people. Huh? It's, a, it's a new competences that we have to, to, to create and to focus on. If I can add something on this uh, main uh, issue of uh, how to, to train, like to say, the, the future healthcare professional, I was thinking in a, in a project on global health organization, we had the impression that uh, this model more focused on community and healthcare community workers uh, could help, is, uh, is working in very... Uh, 
limited and very poor communities where at least the intervention can be more precise and more related to the to the real life condition and or caring conditions also of a community. So sometimes I think we can also learn something looking at uh, models developed in very precarious uh, uh, context uh, to understand how we can deal with a medicine that, that doesn't seem anymore to be powerful or certain as we thought it could be. So there is a medicine that has received a I think a strong attack to her self-representation in terms of a very a totally scientific and powerful medicine. We, we, we are perceiving day by day, I think, and more and more the uncertainty that has always characterized medicine. But this awareness or this new consciousness is very strong. So it demands a reflection, a longer and maybe deeper reflection about uh, which are other models that can be that we could consider in order to think of different uh, uh, training, different better training. Thank you. So I think now I would like to to go on uh, another half an hour, but I know. I think our time has gone and uh, uh, you are all of you are also very committed and some of you very tired for the, the long day. And so I thank uh, all and everybody for coming. I thank our speaker, uh, Eduardo, Renzo and Angela. I thank again uh, Michele Nicoletti and Marco Ventura. Uh, I hope to see you for the next episode. The, 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 the next one will be on May 18th. We will talk about equity and justice uh, in the allocation of scarce resources. So we will talk about the admission of patients in the intensive care units, about the distribution of vaccine uh, that has already been uh, discussed and uh, and we will move on with the other episodes that we can find on the web page of, uh, of, of the Center for Religious Studies. Uh, I thank uh, most of all Isabella Mazé and Graciela um, Di Bella who helped us in creating this uh, platform and launching this event. So uh, have a very nice evening and uh, I hope to see you soon. <laughs>